a lot of the time this talk was given in internal medicine grand rounds uh, four months ago. Um, but so I, when, when, you know, I guess Ruben was asking if I could share something that um, could, would, would be kind of translational. And um, D Dan is uh, working on a sepsis and mate cell project, but the story is not all that complete. And I thought, well, maybe I should talk about something to do with um, my other, another side of my lab, which is kind of harnessing immune responses for epidemiology uh, of infectious diseases. So I've worked on cholera for the past um, 11, 10, 11 years, and uh, I've been, one of, and, and I'll, introduce, so I'll introduce you to cholera, but uh, one of my, the really great things about cholera is that the immunologists and the microbiologists and the public health people and the epidemiologists all work together. We all see, we all go to three or four meetings together in the same year, and um, so one of the joys I have is learning some epidemiology off my collaborators, and so um, this, this really is a kind of description of how the immunologists and the epidemiologists work together on a disease. Um, so just a very brief outline. I'm going to talk about cholera uh, for about 10 minutes, talk about the WHO goal of ending cholera by 2030. Uh, I'll tell you what ending means, because <laughs> um, it's very uh, complicated. Uh, and then improving, how do we improve college surveillance with serological or immunologic methods? Um, so does anyone know what this map is? Oh, I think I do. This is um, the water. It's about water. The so London. Flashbacks down my undergrad. Yeah, so London. Um, uh, so Broad Street, OK, the Broad Street pump. Um, Oh, no. What happened? All right, all right. And this pump, actually, um, I was just there last, about a month ago. I had a beer at the pub that was named after Jon Snow, who is the, um, who, who they now have a plaque after. Uh, and he, he is known to be some of the founder of modern epidemiology. He was an anesthesiologist who, did not believe when everyone told him that cholera, this diarrheal disease, was due to bad air. And he, he knew about gases. And he said, there's no way people are getting diarrhea from gases. Uh, and so he went and he went about tracing all the cases of cholera around his neighborhood, around this neighborhood that, that was having an outbreak. And he found out that every one of those um, houses, homes that had cholera got their water from this pump. And so they, he convinced the city to take the handle off the pump, and then when he took the handle off the pump, um, the outbreak stopped. Right. So there's a, a, a very long history behind cholera epidemiology. Cholera is caused by a bacterium called Vibrio cholerae. Uh, it's a gram negative. There's two types of cholera, uh, O1 and O139. So this is the O antigen. So there's O1, O2, O3. But there's actually only two that causes outbreaks around the world. O1 causes 95% of the outbreaks, and nowadays it causes 100% of the outbreaks. There hasn't been an O13 outbreak probably for 15 years now. Um, it's contaminated food and water, so you know, water, uh, pump. Uh, in 3 million cases a year, 100,000 deaths a year, and endemic in more than 50 countries. If you look at what reporting of cholera deaths and cases are, these, this is the, out of the last WHO um, uh, rec weekly record that reported on cholera. And this is 2017. And you'll see that they have colored, uh, and th this is deaths, right? Uh, and, and so some of these are, um, oops. so some countries, in, and you'll see most of Sub Saharan Africa reports deaths due to cholera, some of South Asia, uh, Haiti, and the DR. All right. Um, but I, I bolded reporting because this is voluntary. So this is a, a country uh, saying that we have this many cases of cholera. Um, and if you look at Bangladesh, now I, I lived for four years in Bangladesh after I finished my fellowship. And um, I worked at a cholera hospital where there were over 400 admissions a day for, during the cholera season just with cholera. I knew there was cholera there, but they don't report any cases of cholera. So, so um, and it, it's actually estimated that there's over a million cases a year in Bangladesh of cholera. Um, but 
but it's not reporting. So, the, <clears throat> so why don't they re are they like are they filling out sheets and just misrepresenting or right. they not filling out sheets? So they're right. So it's a great question. So so what is the what's not been so basically a lot of countries don't want to ruin the tourism or their exports by saying that they have cholera, and so they're just not filling out anything. They're they're just saying, well, we have diarrhea. That's it. We have watery diarrhea. We don't have cholera. If you actually look at Ethiopia, uh, they, they just recognized for the first time this year that they have cholera. Actually, Bangladesh is starting, their government is starting to see that they do have cholera, um, even though the cholera hospital has existed since the 60s. Um, but the WHO does recognize this, and in this article they say that no more incomplete reporting from countries in Asia that probably have the largest proportion of global cholera burden. So this burden that's reported is probably less than a tenth or less than 20% of what's truly going on around the globe. Uh, makes, it in, makes an accurate description of the epidemiology of cholera impossible. So just remember this, this is a big problem in cholera. We don't really know where it is. And we don't know the extent of the problem in a lot of the places that, that it happens. Um, so some groups have tried to estimate uh, the global cholera incidence. This is back in the 2012 uh, WHO bulletin where a, a number of uh, epidemiologists looked at publications, they looked at local re news reports, and just kind of tried to pull all the data together. And this is probably a better estimate. Uh, this is incidence rate, not deaths. Um, and you'll see Bangladesh is actually one of the t higher incidence countries in, Canada, uh, in, 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 in Asia. Um, and in Africa, there, most of sub Saharan Africa is endemic for cholera. All right. Uh, and, and then, but if you, and if you look at what's reported, um, it really is is a smattering of places. If you, uh, th this this here in um, the '90s was a Peru South American outbreak that has since gone away. So you'll see the, the hashed marks for the Americas. There weren't any more cases by um, over 2000. And that's just because the the um, Central American and South American outbreak. Uh, was, was gone. Um, and then Haiti appeared in 2010. Uh, and then this is Yemen. Uh, and Yemen reported a lot of cases, but they actually may have actually even overestimated. So they estimated somewhere around a million cases in 2017. They may have overestimated, but this is actually the extent at which most Asian countries should be reporting the number of cases and, and, and they don't. Um, so you probably see a whole log fold higher if all the countries actually reported what they had. Can I ask you a question? Why didn't they include Europe in here at all? Because there's no cholera in Europe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I think Europe probably last cholera case was over 50 years ago. Um, that's endemic. So, okay. um, so same, same with same with the U.S. We kind of got there were plenty of cholera in the U.S. and then we when we put in pipes um, and and, and um, good sanitation and uh, we got rid of cholera. So um, I don't know if this is going to work, but let, let's try. And I'm just going to play this. Um. Uh, maybe. maybe this will work. That did not. All right, so let me just. Um, <coughs> Make this work again, and I'll replay it. It's, so it's it's just like a, a minute long video of someone who came, this so this is the DACA hospital, which is where I worked uh, up, actually in the four years before I came to Utah. Um, you guys can hear it. Okay. Mohamed is about to go. Especially 
guy is fucked. Now he has no power. <laughs> so it is the military man. So we give the double challenge here by two hands. In the U.S. here, we'd be starting a central line for someone who didn't have a pulse, but um, those nurses are amazing at getting IVs in their pulses patients. 10 minutes or 12 minutes, if he didn't arrive here, he may really die. Yeah, because he's so weak. He Okay, so um, so this is just to give you all an idea of how someone with cholera may present with severe cholera. Um, that the, just a couple of things about cholera: the incubation period is two, one to two days. So usually within a day or two of drinking contaminated water or food, uh, the diarrhea starts. Stool output, and why people die is that you can have up to a liter an hour of stool output. So if you imagine how many liters of blood or fluid you contain in your body, um, and how many hours might take someone to get from um, their home to a rehydration center, uh, that, that's why people either become pulseless uh, or, or are dead on, on arrivals because of this horrendous amount of um, uh, dehydration and resulting in hypovolemic shock. Um, the duration of symptoms is 46 days. We had a patient, I remember, who uh, was about a liter an hour for more than three days, and we had to put over 70 liters back into her. Um, but those are the extreme cases. Uh, and, but mo most, most patients, they come in uh, fairly dehydrated, and, and then their, di once you get, uh, their diarrhea kind of slows down over, over this period. So maybe the first couple of days is um, quite severe, and then uh, it, it, the diarrhea output slows down. Uh, and the mortality, it, it's quite variable. Everybody in the last 10 years who've come to ICDRB with a pulse has left with a pulse. Um, in fact, most, uh, many of who come in without a pulse leave with a pulse because all, you know, the, the, the treatment is rehydration. The reason there's a 50% on there is because of places like Haiti or Yemen where people just can't get to a rehydration center because of an earthquake and no roads or a war and there's bullets that are preventing them from getting to, to hydration. Um, so, so, so that's why the mortality really depends on how easy it is for you to get to the rehydration center and how well the physicians there um, recognize your dehydration and pour fluids into you. All right, so just a couple of things on management. I know this is more a research um, seminar, but, but uh, what's important is that management is done correctly uh, and that uh, you start with IV and then you move into once someone regains consciousness or is able to drink on their own, you do oral fluids. What's on the right is a uh, package of oral rehydration salts. It contains glucose, salts, and bicarb. And so um, the glucose is to help absorb uh, salts in your intestines. So it used to be just salts and then people figured out, well, actually you need glucose to absorb the salts and so now there's glucose in it. Um, and and it, it, you mix this package with a liter of clean water, and, and this is how most people actually are at home rehydrated through this. Um, the, what's on the left is a, called a cholera cot, and the reason it's really important is that uh, it, it serves two purposes. One is infection control. So imagine a liter an hour, you're, you're running to the bathroom constantly, uh, and we just, there's just not enough toilets around. So uh, there's a hole in, that, in the middle of that bed, uh, in that cot, uh, with the chutes down to the bucket, and, and people are stooling into the bucket. And the second purpose is that, so when the bucket fills up, you put bleach in it, and then you pour it down the sink. Um, the, the, the second purpose is to measure how much fluids is being lost. So if in, you know, in two hours this, they fill up the bucket, you know that in the next two hours, this patient needs the equivalent amount of the bucket to go into back into their body, right? And, and, and it's, there, there's like one nurse for every 20 or 40 patients. There's one doctor for every 100 patients. Um, you rely on the family to figure out how much fluid to put back in and to help put the fluid back in. If the nurse helps figure out how much fluid was lost, and then the family members gets the fluid uh, 
for the patient. This is a um, typical ward that uh, is in the hospital that I worked at. So you see lines, rows and rows and rows of these cots uh, where people are, are, are being rehydrated. And you'll see there's very few IV poles in there. Once they get IV rehydration in the emergency room, um, they, they will then go to the wards where, where they just continue with the oral rehydration salts. Um, just the diagnosis, mostly by clinical assessment, uh, probably less than 1%, maybe less than 0.1% of cases of cholera worldwide are um, actually diagnosed by a, a um, microbial detection. So either a culture or a rapid diagnostic test, it's just not enough money uh, to, and, or facilities to do that. That's the other reason why some countries don't report it. They just don't have diagnostics. Right. Um, and then oral rehydration is the treatment. Uh, IV, if there's severe dehydration, and antibiotics only for cases of severe dehydration. It shortens, the antibiotics don't cure you of cholera. The rehydration does, the antibiotics just shortens the duration. So instead of five days, you might be able to stop having severe diarrhea in two or three days. And also, it may prevent transmission. Can I ask you a really stupid question? And it, it really is. So, can, can, do, do you have a lot of resistance? I'm just imagining how much you have to drink, right? Mm -hmm. Do people just do it because there's no option? Or it just seems like yeah. that would just be so hard. I'm just imagining drinking liters yeah. of yeah. water. Right. And, and it, this, is, this is actually kind of a flavored with some sugar and some salts. It's not the best thing you right. can drink. I'm right. I'm just imagining, um, yeah. I mean, people know that they need it. It's, it's, so, so they just do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And um, I mean, if you're nauseated, you can't keep things down, then you need the IV. But, okay. um, you know, I, I think we, we just see hundreds of patients being, and, and a lot of them are kids, and you just kind of make them. Make them, yeah, <laughs> drink it. yeah. yeah. Um, every, I mean, every one of these patients has a family member standing beside them. <clears throat> you see a chair beside each of these cots, and that family member's job is to make sure they drink the rehydration salts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I have another question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, this is my understanding of vibrio cholera as a microaerophile. How does it grow in the gut? So, the, the, the growth is actually or is in the environment. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, what it does in the gut is that it, it um, well, it att attaches uh, to the, or it, 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 it colonizes, and then it elaborates toxin mm -hmm. that then um, activate the cyclic AMP and the whole kind of uh, ion secretion channels. So, um, can it replicate in the gut? What well, is it, it closely associated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, so you, yeah. Like so you, you, I think I'm not. I don't. I'm not sure that it really does all that much replication. Uh, as much as it just kind of is that it, you know does all its its functions of, of toxin secretion. Um, if it's in the environment, is it secreting that much toxin? No, it's it's actually a, it's a, it's actually a, a, it expresses very different genes when it's in the environment. Um, mm -hmm. So there's this Gary Skolnick had this um, paper out about five years ago about the bistable switch that. Um, so it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it kind of detects the environmental pH and, 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 and other signals for it to switch on and off various uh, genes. So it's, it's, I mean, it's a very smart bug. It knows when it needs to kind of, and, and, and it, it's, get, it, it's really amazing. It, it, um, it, it's able to really sense where it is and what it needs to do in certain environments. And um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the the thought is that if so, you know, some, some of these kind of clean water, and then also you need somewhere around ten to the six to ten to the eight to actually cause symptoms of the bacteria in your gut. Yeah. So unlike Shigella, which you'll probably only need ten or a hundred bacteria to cause symptoms, cholera you need a lot more. Um, so, actually related to that, the prevention for cholera is clean water, um, and and and, uh, and it's also good sanitation. So, this is a a picture I took in Haiti of uh, inside a cholera treatment center of how one should dispose of stools, uh, um, and, and it's using bleach and then dumping it down, and um, and then there's a cholera vaccine. All right. Um, so wash, or, so oral cholera vaccine is about 
uh, 60 to 70 percent effective over five years in adults and children over five. In children under five, it is pretty poor, less than 30 percent efficacy. In some studies, zero percent. Um, so, my immunology side is that um, we, we were working on how we might improve cholera vaccination through um, adjuvants or, or, or other means. Um, so, the current cholera vaccine is a killed whole cell vaccine. Uh, against the 201139 uh, that, that uh, are responsible for the uh, endemic cholera. It's called Shankol. It's being stockpiled by WHO. So right now, so since about well, five years ago when it started stockpile, if a country requests a vaccine supply, like a million doses for Iraq, for example, um, the WHO within days will have made a decision as to whether they, they um, are able to get it out, and if they are, then it's out within a week. So the last, uh, probably most publicized rollout was in Mozambique after the natural disaster there, uh, and, and they were able to get like a million doses out. Yeah. Why um, is the FC so different for adults versus children? Is it just that children's immune system, yeah. they're a lot more vulnerable, or? Yeah, my, my entire five years in the postdoc was trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I, I think we've come down to um, mainly that children mount poor LPS responses. So this vaccine is mostly, so the, the determinant of protection is probably the immune response against polysaccharide antigen of the of vibro cholera. Um, and so little kids, because possibly because of their kind of more tolerant immune system or immature immune system, cannot mount good LPS um, antibody responses in their, in, systemically or in the gut. And so uh, that that's probably why um, you know the, I, I think I think there's it, it also could be related to um, that they haven't been primed as much as adults and older children have been uh, earlier in their life. But uh, so, so there's a there's a few hypotheses and probably mostly about LPS and immune responses to that. Dr. Martin, uh, are there, uh, is there any move to vaccinate pregnant women? Great question. Yeah, so th th this is the problem, as you may know, is that all these clinical trials, they, they try to exclude pregnant women, uh, but th there's now more and more trials where they're including the pregnant women, and, and there hasn't been any problems. Uh, and when they did retrospectively, when they vaccinated entire communities during an outbreak, um, there had, uh, th that pregnant women have not had higher uh, rates of you know, miscarriage or, um, or premature birth. Um, the, the, what is evident is that when, when they've done studies of pregnant women with cholera, that they have a much higher mortality rate uh, in, in miscarriage rates. So, yeah. But is there any benefit in terms of uh, newborn protection or if people look at that? Because that, that's a good yeah. thing now for us is uh, vaccinating pregnant women to provide newborn immunity. Yeah, good question. I think there probably is uh, in terms of the transfer of antibodies uh, and um, we, you know, I, I'm not sure we, we really know, I mean, we, we have much data in that because there hasn't been a trial of it in pregnant women. There's just been kind of observational studies. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we really know what their problem is. Yeah. How long does the vaccine take to work? Uh, you have, there's a pretty good antibody. So, so this vaccine is a license of two dose vaccine, day zero and day 14. They've been trying to, they've been doing a lot of single dose studies and it looks like single dose studies, they, 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 they are just as efficacious but not as long duration of protection. Um, and so within uh, a week of a single dose, you get a pretty good antibody response. Um, the question is in a naive population, um, so these are all endemic populations who probably is really that dose is a booster because they probably had it when they were two or three or five. Um, uh, and, and so in, in a naive population, it may take longer for the second, uh, after, so it may require that second dose. But yeah, it's, it's a pretty quick uh, amount, of, uh, amount of antibody responses. Yeah. And how long is the last? The protection is at least five years. Uh -huh. uh, and again, all these studies were in endemic regions where people are probably getting boosted subclinically, so without knowing that they've I mean, they, they probably are constantly exposed to cholera during monsoon season or pre-monsoon season. And so they're probably getting little boosters. And, and that's probably why 
it is a pretty is a much longer lasting vaccine. Um, so yeah, awesome. yeah. Um, there is a live attenuated vaccine that is marketed to U.S. travelers. It's two hundred fifty dollars a dose, um, and it, it, that one is the one that would work. You know, it is work would work faster than the killed vaccine. It, it's live. You're, you're immediately. Um, and that one, I think the recommendation is that uh, you have a week before travel. So, um, so just a summary of my introduction to cholera. So it's endemic in more than 50 countries, most of Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Um, acute watery diarrhea, shock, hypovolemic shock, leading to death. Rehydration is the mainstay of management. Uh, and there is a good cholera vaccine. All right, now to ending cholera, which is kind of tied into why I'm studying the APCR epidemiology. Um, so two years ago, WHO put out this fairly ambitious plan uh, to end cholera. And, and, and the reason they think this is the time to do this is that we have a cholera vaccine, and this vaccine just came out, um, and it has been proven to be effective really in the last five years uh, before this, this was put out. Uh, it's a disease that um, is of, of inequity. It only kills the poorest, the most vulnerable. Uh, and, and that if we fail to act now, uh, more urbanization, climate change, population growth uh, will just get worse, make cholera worse as a global problem in the upcoming years. All right, um, so there, it, it, it's actually not ending cholera in the whole world. It, it's, I don't think anybody thinks that we can ever eradicate cholera from the world. Um, but what they've done is, if you just focus on the right hand side, is for 20 countries, so remember there's around 50 to 60 countries with cholera, so 20 of those countries to completely eliminate cholera, it's possible, I'll show you an example of that, and that there are no more catastrophic cholera outbreaks. So what is, was a catastrophic outbreak? Uh, what happened in Haiti? Um, several thousand people died. And what happened in Yemen? Uh, was several death, thousand deaths. So those are catastrophic. Um, that would, and that would, if you just eliminate 20 countries and large outbreaks, you will reduce 90% of the deaths due to cholera around the world. Um, and what the, my focus has been on is, is this access to, so access one is early detection response to contained outbreaks, access two is intervention in the hotspots, access three is really a political kind of coordinating uh, at country levels. Um, and among these kind of interventions and hotspots, uh, it's surveillance and reporting and the use of cholera vaccine. Now, is it possible to end cholera? Is it possible to eliminate cholera from countries? Well, from countries like US and Europe, European countries with pipes, yes. You, you, you can't get rid of cholera when you put all the pipes in. Um, and, and clean water to, to, to uh, people. Um, but Vietnam is one success story where they made their own cholera vaccine for many, many years. They deployed it um, between 98 and 2012, and they concentrated on the hotspots. So the, the blue dots are are, are where they deployed vaccine, and the the colors um, of shades of red to yellow are the hot spots of cholera inside Vietnam. So they mapped it down to the kind of the district uh, level. Uh, what how many cases of cholera? So they had a good surveillance system. They mapped things, and then they just vaccinated everyone around those uh, hot spots. And they were so on this graph. Uh, on the, the, the red bars is number of cases of cholera, and the green line is how many vaccines they used. Uh, each, and this is 91 to 2012. And so the last case of cholera in Vietnam was 2010. Now, I'll, I'll say that in that period, Vietnam also went through a huge improvement in their public health infrastructure. They, their GDP, I think, tripled um, over, over that time. Um, or actually more. I, I, I looked at some GDP numbers. I don't uh, a while ago. I didn't. Re, um, I can't quote them to you now. But there was a there was a huge increase in uh, sanitation infrastructure in that country. So, cholera vaccine plus sanitation infrastructure and clean water. So it is possible. Um, so, but what are some of the challenges? So some of this is the rationale for what, what I'm studying and. One is the lack of access to clean water sanitation. This is obvious, right? Like you, you need a lot of money to put in clean water Let and like. what's that? Let there be light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, an inadequate vaccine supply. So right now the stockpile has a million doses, maybe up to five million. Um, 
there are billions of people at risk for cholera, uh, and I think if every country with cholera requested from the stockpile, uh, you would need several hundred million doses. I mean, Bangladesh alone has 160 million people, right? So, um, vaccine underperformance in young children. Uh, so, as we mentioned, that that's a big problem because you, um, it just doesn't work in kids, little kids. And, and but it's because of these. The above three, it's difficult to identify key populations at high risk of disease. If you don't have enough vaccine, you have to target those who really need it. Um, and so, what are those key populations? Which regions in Yemen should they be vaccinating? Which towns in Haiti should they be vaccinating? Um, or in Bangladesh, should they vaccinate the whole country? Or are there places where, if you can control those hotspots, um, the rest of the country would also not have as much cholera? Um, and also, we don't really know when we intervene. So let's say they put in a new tube well, in a, in a, in, in, or they implement a new wash strategy, you know, gave, you know better, better sanitation um, to a certain region. It's hard to measure whether people are being exposed to cholera or less, unless you sample every stool that comes out of a diarrhea patient, which is you know, hundreds of people a day uh, in, in, in many of these cities. Um, so the surveillance obstacles. This is a cholera treatment center in Yemen, um, it, it, and, and this is you know, obviously an obstacle, right? Like if your surveillance, if you're, if you're, the only way you can know whether someone has cholera is to take a look at their stool sample to see if there's cholera in it, and your lab and your clinic looks like that. Um, you, there's no way of reporting how many people had cholera. Maybe you know how many diarrhea patients came this week. How many had cholera? No one knows. Or this is Haiti. So this is uh, I took this picture from a. A, a road, the highway, the main highway that goes from um, Port-au-Prince down to the southern coast, um, and you can see just mountains upon mountains, right? So if you live down in this valley and your treatment center was here, fine. But if you live on the other side of that mountain and your treatment center was where I was standing, you have like a day of walking up a cliff and then down a cliff and then up another one. So. Um, so if someone died on the other side of the mountain due to cholera, or if there were an outbreak down there, no one would know. It's, you know they might hear it, but there's no, there would be no confirmation. Um, we, you know, even if there was diarrhea, no one would really know if it was cholera or not. Um, so, so the things I'm listing in this slide are, are, are quite important. Um, so it's important to identify high risk populations and target control efforts. Um, but these four points are why it's hard to do that. Um, that our existing methods rely on clinical reporting of acute watery diarrhea. Um, that that's relies on a good clinic uh, in, in, in a standing one. Uh, and then infrequently confirmed by microbial detection. You need a lab, all right? And, and there's not that many clinics with labs. It, so it relies on the functional healthcare system. It fails to capture non-medically attended cases. So, if you're mildly symptomatic, you will probably not go to the clinic, especially if you need to go through a war zone or you don't have the money to get transport there. Um, and, and those, but those are important, right? Those are shedding into the, those, those are still shedding into the local water supply, um, and, and and so you want to know even the mild cases. Uh, the low specificity of suspected case definitions. Right now, the WHO has studies acute watery diarrhea. You have a suspected case of cholera. I mean, that is not very specific. Acute water diarrhea. And, and you know, it's not everybody comes in with a liter an hour. Um, you know, some people are just, well, I just started having diarrhea today. Um, and and, and they're, 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 they're not, they're fine. Um, so, and it fails to capture the spatial and temporal uh, heterogeneity of disease. One center, you, it's really difficult to know, kind of, if you have a line list from centers, so this is how it works. So, so these clinics, they keep a line list of how many people come and what their names are, um, and then it's submitted to the health authorities and they go to the WHO. Um, it's really hard to capture kind of what region and where, where in the region we're coming from. So how can we improve our estimates of cholera exposure and risk in the population? So one of the solutions, so I, I told you that, um, you know, right now every case of cholera that, we, that, that is suspected and is only can be confirmed by um, microbial technique. Well, what about using antibodies in, in blood? Well, this is independent then of case finding. So you don't need to actually find the cases when they happen. You need to figure, you can just take the blood of someone and figure out whether there is something in that blood that signals exposure in the past. 
Um, and also, you don't need to detect the micro when it's still living. Uh, you can be sick three months after cholera when there's no more cholera in the stool, but it's still a sign of cholera in the blood. Now, this is well established for other infectious diseases. Um, you may you know, think of things like HIV, uh, where someone comes in, gives a blood sample, and, and you're looking for an HIV antibody, or even something like Lyme disease, where you come in, you look for a Lyme antibody test. Um, so so it's, it's, it's there for many of the viral diseases, especially, and some bacterial diseases. Uh, but not, it's new for cholera. And so the questions that we had to think of, of answering were which type of antibody to measure. So there are, you know, over 4,000 open reading frames in, in verbal cholera. Um, there are many, many potential antigens. Which one of them would someone make an antibody response to? And, and of those, uh, which one will have some kind of persistence of antibody response for? months or years because you really want to know if someone had cholera you know a week ago a month ago or a year ago not just those who have had cholera in the last month right um and then yeah so the, the levels what what translates to protection what translates to exposure so uh just briefly of the methods of our research uh daca is in this country size of the state of georgia or iowa and 160 million people so half of the u.s fitting into iowa um Daca hospital, lots of beds of, uh, of cholera patients, but upstairs there's a great group of scientists that I worked with uh, for four years um, with flow cytometers and sequencers and lots of hoods uh, and just smart scientists. It's just great, innovative, great uh, people to work with. Um, so so we've, we've published some of this uh, just earlier this year. Uh, and the epidemiologist I worked with was is Andrew Asman from Johns Hopkins. Uh, and the immunologists I worked with were at the DACA hospital and ICDRB. So, um, first, which type of antibody to uh, predict exposure? So we had 320 cholera patients. Uh, we drew blood every three months for three years. Uh, and then we measured different kinds of cholera antibody response. We had done some preliminary studies looking at 10 different antigens. And we chose the antigens, and we ended up with these antigens that we know last for at least six months, okay? So um, the, the one that's most prominent is called the rubicidal. For those who do antibody tests, this is not an ELISA. This test is really complicated, and I'll explain later. Uh, and so, so just to orient you to this graph, on the y-axis is the level of antibody, is the titer, okay? It's, it's, it's in log. Um, and then so is, so is the x-axis, it, it's in log days. Uh, since symptom onset. So, so we actually had day two because that's kind of, usually we don't get per, um, someone coming in just on the day of the onset. Um, so it's day two, and we actually, these are culture confirmed. So it takes us a day to confirm their stool, has cholera in their stool, and we draw the blood on day two. Uh, and then on day seven, uh, usually by day seven, they're either home or they're about to go home, uh, and then draw it at day 30, 90, 180, and every three months after that. And so, as you might expect, our antibodies go up really quickly and then down very, very slowly. And this is actually nice because it actually doesn't go down all the way to baseline levels, even at three years time for a few of the folks. We, we looked at this in a bunch of IgA, IgG against lipopolysaccharide. Remember I, earlier I mentioned that lipopolysaccharide, the LPS is likely uh, a big determinant of, of protection, as well as cholera toxin. Uh, and in some, did better than others in terms of how long they persisted. Uh, and so then um, we did uh, a, how well each of them predicted the infection time window. So um, if, if, you, if you look at the, and we did this using um, AUC, so cross-validated uh, uh, user operating curves, uh, uh, area under the operating curve. Um, and you can see that, in general, the, the, the riboside and the C, cholera toxin IgG, so the orange and the pink uh, dots were the best for performers for predicting whether someone had cholera in the last 100 days or 200 days or 365 days. We then thought, well, maybe we should also account for things like age, um, uh, blood group, uh, and then what if we just took all these antibodies uh, titers and combined them all 
And so we use some machine learning, we use Brown Forest, and we combine all these parameters. Uh, and, and then we looked at um, variable importance. Um, uh, it's kind of using kind of a Gini um, coefficient. And we, we were able to determine, let's say this is 365, the infection window, we figured out that the viricidal and the CT, CTIGG responses were likely the most important. And it was interesting that actually none of our um, demographic or clinical variables were really important at all. We, we actually thought age was going to be really important, um, but they, it wasn't. It, it, was, it was the most important demographic characteristic because, uh, again, like the, the older you are, um, especially when, when you're in the, that early um, childhood group, um, the, the better response you could get. But, but in the end, if you're going to pick a couple of things that uh, could predict time since exposure, uh, it's going to be a riverside or your CT IgG. Um, so yeah, demographic variables do not add much to the performance of serologic markers. And then we said, well, I don't want to use the full model, because that's seven or eight different antibody tests, plus collecting a bunch of clinical data. Why don't we just use two markers? And so when you use two markers, such as erubicidal or one of the ELISA targets, such as CTIGG, you actually get pretty good performance. So this is a, the average AUC over a different number of days, uh, and we get over 90% performance uh, of AUC, average AUC. Um, and the riverside assay alone does actually pretty well using cutoffs. It does worse as you get out to a year, so there's, it's not as specific. And, and actually, um, we really do want something that's very specific, but you know, we, we just kind of try to play around with the best combination of sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and then we have, so we have cutoff titers. So if your titer was at 1280, you probably had cholera 10 days ago, uh, within the last 10 days. If your titer was higher than 320, you probably had cholera more than 360, or at least a year ago, okay. Did, did you follow them over time, like looking at cholera, I don't know, counts or whatever in your school to see if some of them mm. would be like moderately exposed but not so not? Yeah, yeah, so they got a stool sample at each time that they got a blood draw. Okay. And we we filled, we, we censored out any that had positive, well, so actually, no, no, we, not at every blood draw. We, we, we got them on the early blood draws we had stool sample, but actually what we censored out were people who had increases in titers. But we don't we actually don't know. They they probably were boosted. It's if you sample every three months, they probably you know, there's no unless you sampled every week, probably no way of knowing who actually got boosted or not. We did censor out those who actually had increased in titer during our three year follow up though. Oh god. Yeah. Um, but yeah, probably people were, were boosted. Um, were exposed. It, it's it's difficult, right? So is then what you're, we're, but but this is probably the 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 case we saw were severe enough to go to the hospital, and so they were probably the highest inoculum. But no one, yeah, it, it's it's quite messy when you think of well, was there exposure? Were they exposed again continuously, and are we reset? We need to reset those exposure windows. Yeah, um, and then but but this is what made it pretty cool was that we then. Um, <clears throat> There was a challenge study in, in the, on the East Coast. Uh, this is for vaccine purposes, but um, they took volunteers, mainly med students and grad students, and they challenged them with cholera, and they drew their blood over six months. Um, and so we didn't do this. We just got the serum samples that they had left over from the challenge study. So we had uh, something around 40 uh, North American, totally naive, they've never traveled, volunteers' blood, who we knew had a certain inoculum of cholera that produced diarrhea. Right. And so we ran the same model and it actually worked pretty well. Um, we only did it up to 200 days because we had a six month blood draw and we didn't have the one year blood draw. Um, and so we think that even with, even in a situation where the exposure is not constant, um, that, that this, this ser serologic prediction of when they were exposed works. You'll notice the AUCs are not as good, um, but but it works. I, I, think, I think this was very reassuring for us that in a completely different system, it worked. Um, I, I just want to go over what the ribocidal assay is, because th this is what, what we found to be by far the best single test to estimate um, cholera. I, I don't know how many of you guys do microbiology. 
Are you done? Okay. And some um, of us are like psychologists. Got it. Okay. So <laughs> I'm always the lowest denominator. Yeah. No. So 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 actually, I mean, but but I, hopefully I drew this um, figure all right. So we first grow. So this here is growing the cholera on a plate. We incubate it overnight. Then um, we we take we we get it to a certain OD, which is density of, of bacteria. Um, then we add complement. So, so this is a bacterial lysis acid. So to lyse bacteria, you need complement and antibody, right? So we, we add, so actually, we'll just go to this. Um, well, in each one of these wells, we have first the cholera, so the little dots here. We have complement, and we have the patient's serum, which contains antibodies. So the antibodies, together with complement, lyses the bacteria. And these are dilutions of the serum. So on the very left is, is not very diluted. So this is where most of the antibody is, okay? On the very right is very diluted, so there's not much antibody here. So let's say you have a million antibodies here, and this dilute down here, you only have one antibody left. So if you have cholera, equal amounts of cholera on every single well, you'll expect that up here, um, all the bacteria will be lysed. You won't see any growth. On this side, there's still going to be a lot of bacteria growing because you don't have antibody to kill the bacteria. All right. So the readout with a plate reader, but you can also use dye, is that um, the bacteria that are killed uh, are won't won't show anything. So remember, this is a lot of antibodies to cholera, and this is very little antibodies to cholera. Um, so it's a way of showing at what dilution of, of the serum do you need to kill cholera, all right? So this is why it's called a vibrial cytal acid. So a measure of, but it takes a day and a half to do. An overnight incubation followed by a full day with a three hour, so, so first like a two hour incubation followed by a three hour incubation. Um, and that's what we're doing in our lab right now. Uh, and so, this is the serial part of serial epidemiology. Uh, usually it's with ELISA technique, but um, we don't have much time. I'm going to skip over. So uh, one of my postdocs worked out how to do this from um, dry blood spots. Uh, and so what is thought we would do is that we would take a target population, let's say a city of 100,000 people in Haiti, uh, and we sample 100 of that population. Or we actually can calculate based on estimated incidence, um, how many we need to sample to actually detect at least some signal. Um, and then we use either a minute puncture or a dry blood spot to estimate the times of the cholera. So you know, <clears throat> depending on how many people had a titer above, let's say 320 or 160, we can say, well, this village, 60% of their inhabitants had cholera in the past year. The next village, 0%, we better vaccinate that next village. Um, and in an outbreak, so MSF, so Dr. Lagoras has, has really been interested in this because in a refugee camp, you don't even know where people came from. And so it's good to get a sense of the population's exposure um, past, and, and so in, in many ways, their infection risk uh, through, through these kind of sampling. Um, but it, it's, that's less epidemiology as much as just management of, of, of or just uh, triaging of interventions. Um, so some of the questions going forward is, do antibody kinetics differ between severe and asymptomatic? Um, so we're, we're now doing a prospective study where we're looking at household contacts of cholera patients that are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, we can detect in their stool, but they're, you know, they're not symptomatic and we see where the antibody response goes. Um, and then looking at, you know, does someone in Bangladesh and someone in Haiti differ in their antibody kinetics? Uh, and then the biggest challenge right now is just how to do this in the field. So uh, we can do this with dry blood spots, but that still requires a lab. So now we're looking at, um, uh, the next couple of slides uh, will be just a description of how we're trying to get this into a microfluidic device. Um, it's not easy because it, you need to grow bacteria, you need to add some complement that needs to be stored at a cold temperature, and then you need to add media at various points and serum at a different point in time. Um, so uh, Telemann and Froze in my lab has been working on lyophilizing storage at different temperatures, um, and then needing to in heat and activate serum or not. So um, I, I do want 10 minutes for questions or at least give you a few minutes. So just to, the take home is that 
Currently, the clinical surveillance for cholera is inadequate due to a number of different both political, natural disasters, um, but also um, kind of biological reasons. Uh, and, and the potential for use of seroepidemiology, which is using antibody titers to estimate recency of exposure um, to guide the use of interventions. Uh, and that we, what we're working on now is developing a field adapted assays to measure cholera specific antibody responses. Um, so, and, and I guess one of the lessons learned in, through all these is that uh, it, it's, it's a huge team effort because cholera, uh, there's so many different parts of, of cholera and, and I certainly don't know all the different parts, but um, so ICDRB, the DACA up there on the left is, is uh, of a scientist as well as uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, which is where I did my postdoc. Uh, and, and that group has been working together now with us for a long time. Um, Haiti and there's a Florida who's so so we have proposed in the grant to do the same thing in Haiti and then they haven't had a cholera case in the past year so um, I think everybody's had cholera and so we're waiting for another couple of years when unfortunately I think it's going to come back hopefully it doesn't but um, uh, so 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 Haiti is where we're setting up some sites um, uh, in the middle there is Sir Pasteur in Ho Chi Minh City which is Vietnam which is um, who they, they came to us and he said, you know, we cannot find cholera in our environment, in stools, in food. How about zero surveillance? And so we're doing zero surveillance in, in, in Vietnam to see, are there still little pockets, even though it's gone from you know, the surveillance, uh, the traditional surveillance sense? Uh, Hopkins with the epidemiology, my lab on the left there, um, and then a bunch of uh, funding sources uh, from the NIH. So, um, so I hope I gave you a sense of what that translational spectrum in, in, in immunology and, ser and epidemiology uh, entails, uh, and happy to take any questions. This is really good. You presented it really well for those of us who might not know a lot about this. Um, do, have people just given up hope of change of fixing water? Well, I mean, because it seems like what it's. I mean, I mean, Haiti, they poured billions of dollars in there, and it's not done anything. Um, I think it takes political willpower and a lot, a lot, a lot of money. So I don't think we've get, people have given up hope. I think these are stopgap interventions, like vaccination. Um, in the end, you know, water and sanitation is what really will change this diarrhea problem in the world. But it, it will take trillions for a city. And that's just not possible for most of the world. So um, I think there are clinical, there's actually a clinical trial ongoing where they're going to completely repipe a slum in, in Fiji and a slum in Indonesia. Uh, literally a multi million dollar um, effort just to s see exactly what is achievable. Uh, mm, and that's cool. Because up to now, the studies have been on oh, let's give some chlorine, let's um, you know, teach people how to wash their hands. Uh, let's stay tube well, or let, let's stay latrines. Um, but but we they haven't. But when when they so there's been two studies, Shine, which is uh, and, and also um, Wash Benefits, uh, and also there's there's been a number of studies in the last five years that have shown that just wash these little wash interventions alone did not change childhood stunting um, or the burden really you know, overall the burden of diarrhea. So now 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 the next step is let's see what complete infrastructure change does. Um, if they find that, I don't really know how they're going to come with money to, to, to really um, make those changes across the world. But, um, but so, sorry, I shouldn't have, you know, we haven't, people haven't given up. But um, I think in terms of the immediacy uh, of that, it, it, it's, there's, there's not much about that, but what's going to change in their sanitation plans. Um, so that's why we need vaccination, we need targeted um, interventions. Washington. Uh, what kind of patient compliance issues do you usually run into, like for patients who might come back with antibody tests, or like how well they keep up? Yeah. Um, things their doctor told them to do. So, in terms of study interventions, um, I, we get a pretty good follow up uh, in Bangladesh because actually um, sometimes our study personnel go visit still uh, in their homes. Um, and, and we set up a, a clinic closer to the slums where it's easier for them to get to. We provide transport incentives, so 
here's some money to make sure you get here back here. Um, in other places, we provide phone cards and such. Um, in Haiti, uh, I, I think there's there's we we still haven't seen how much follow up we're, we're actually going to achieve. But yeah, and in terms of kind of what, what you know, following doctors' advice after discharge um, from cholera. Well, the advice is not to drink dirty water, and some of these people just cannot get around that. They just don't have the finances to, to get clean water. So the, is the cholera toxin gene themselves, are they found in other organisms in nature? Are you guys concerned that you're going to see some uh, great, great uh, question. level gene transfer issues because... Uh, yeah, so, so um, in terms of gene transfer of cholera toxin, not as much as um, there are several... Uh, so for example, ETEC, which is a E. coli, uh, there, it's, it's, it's LT, one of their toxins, has 80% homology or 90% homology with cholera toxin. So some of these bacteria already has something similar to cholera toxin, that, that's, and that's how they cause diarrhea. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing, I, I, I mean, it's, it, it's not as much gene transfer as much as just actually what's messing us up in seroepidemiology is that there's homology in antigens. Yeah. Um, but there's actually, yeah, as Laura may know, there are many ways for the gut to secrete um, fluid, and different um, bugs have come up with different ways to do so, and toxin is just, it's probably the most, the cholera toxin and its analog in LT in, 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 um, um, in, in, in ETEC, it's probably the most markedly, cause the quickest amount of diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So s sometimes you actually, people can mistake an ETEC for cholera uh, because of the rapidity of fluid loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why are they doing this? I mean, why would you do this? If you're, if you're good for your own, you don't actually produce the gut, why would you bother doing this? I mean, what's the what's the evolutionary fitness? Yeah, so, so why do you want to secrete yourself? So that you go back yeah. in the environment and reproduce. So that so it's just- And get into somebody version. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I and, and, and the amount of, um, what, what it does in the gut um, is, yeah, I, I, I think there's, 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 um, you know, it's strategic in that it it's setting itself up so that it can re, it, it can be secreted as quickly as possible in as big numbers as possible. So these waters, these stools contain like, un, incredible millions amount of cholera bacteria. I mean, you just need to take a little drop of it, and you put it in the slide, and you, you know you see things swimming around. Um, it's yeah. So so that's that's a strategy. Um, and I think no, I think it does reproduce in the gut. I, I just, um, but you know, I think its main goal is to get symptoms and, and force itself out.